Welcome to Books in Sight, the podcast where we give our insight into books. I'm Ren. I'm Don. And today we're going to be talking about why we read. And obviously, I think the logical place to start is, why do you read? <laughs> so <laughs> since you uh, outpaced me a little bit in terms of number of books read, uh, okay. let's start with you. So why do you read? Um. I think I read for the same reason that I'm going to assume anybody reads, which is basically two avenues, information and entertainment, if you want to call it that. And under entertainment, you can still subdivide, I think, be between passing the time of day versus a more studious approach to reading where you're enjoying it. It's part You're reading it for enjoyment, but it's also a challenge, perhaps, or... Uh, a little bit of effort to read, depending on the nature of the writing or the nature of the storyline or whatever it is. Uh, we were talking in terms of translations the last time. That's one other thing that could be both information and entertainment is to find out about another culture or another mm -hmm. time in history, even. So there's um, basically those two. And I, I would, you know, put nonfiction primarily in information, but if it's well written, it can certainly be entertaining too. So I, I would, I, in my mind, those are the two big categories. I don't know if you have another way to divide it up. Yeah, I, I, I guess when I was approaching this, I was also kind of thinking about that separation between nonfiction and fiction. Um, and for me, with being primarily a fiction reader, though my nonfiction reading has picked up a little bit over the last couple of years, but I would say for me, it's also like, and it's not even a conscious decision which direction I'm going to take a, a given book. But for me, it's sort of like reading to understand something about yourself yeah. and reading to understand something about the world and That's other good. people. Um, yeah, just because like I've had so many instances where I felt something come unlocked, you know, like a level in a game or something where it's yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand something about usually the world there are fewer instances where I could cite a book where I felt like I've got some great insight into myself but I would say those are also very meaningful reading experiences for me and it's mm -hmm. it's something that when I pick up any book I kind of have the expectation that one of those two things will happen actually I, I just uh, ran across a good example of that or I think it mm -hmm. fits kind of what you're saying I was hearing Judy Bloom the young adult mm -hmm. writer being interviewed Mm -hmm. and they were talking about, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, which I never really knew what that was about because I never read it. But apparently it's the girl leading up to her first menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I think the author thought, I think girls that are prior to that moment in their lives might like to have some insights into what's going on. You know, so mm -hmm. it is sort of uh, a way for a young girl to get an insight into herself and what's happening with her body or about to happen or whatever, which, you know, um, I think that's pretty valuable. And yeah. the other, other ones can, I mean, you were implying, I mean, it could be psychological uh, of how to, you know, how somebody handles another person or mm -hmm. under a certain circumstance or why people break up. Maybe that's explored in a book and you can see how that could happen, or you might see it around you, or you might say, I'm going to try to avoid that. You know, yeah. So th yeah, there's certainly an awful lot of learning about oneself and about society from reading novels or, or, or anything. Yeah. And I mean, just to kind of springboard off of that, I would even go a step further and say, uh, to be more specific, when I say I feel like you can learn something about the world, I, I think, and specifically about people, I, I think you learn both how people are the same, but also how people are different. And I think that those can be equally valuable. And I believe, if I remember correctly, it was um, Salman Rushdie, who in an interview that I watched with him at some point, um, mm -hmm. said that for him, fiction is about like getting at human truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that stayed with me as like a phrase that I do also think about when I read from time to time of like, what is the what is kind of under the hood of this book? What am I getting out of this? What is this trying to say? Right. To I me? think that's where um, pop fiction, if I can call mm. it that, trades largely in 
cliches or mm. standard, you know, normal standards that might be an insight for somebody, a given, you know, yeah. nobody knows everything. Uh, so at any given moment, you might get that kind of insight from a very pop book. But normally, that's what you look for when you're digging through Salman Rushdie or somebody of that caliber, yeah. that their insights might be more penetrating, more likely that they know things you don't know yet. <laughs> I think. Well, and I think that's an, an interesting question. And I almost feel like that's a topic in and of itself is kind of that division between literary and genre and pop fiction. We can put a pin in that because I actually think that's really an interesting exploration as well. Sure. But, yeah. but I think also like in terms of why do we read, I think that you're right, that there is some sort of expectation of a book to be insightful. And I actually was going to use that as a springboard, if I may, of like why reading is to me different than other types of hobbies that would be in a similar vein, like, you know, watching a film or um, listening to music or something like that. Because yeah. I think that, and I, I'm prepared to be disputed on this because I know there are people that disagree, but to me, watching a film or listening to music tend to feel very passive to me. Yeah. Whereas reading, even no matter, no matter what it is that you're reading, especially about fiction, I'll make that distinction. But like to me, especially reading fiction never feels like a passive exercise. Right. It feels like a very active process. I don't, it just sounds like it's similar for you. Oh, I totally agree. I just, I just read a book called, What Do We See When We Read? But in that book, he, he gives an example from Anna Karenina. He, he, he cites some of the details that are given throughout the book. So you know what she quote looks like. But he's pointing out that that's really not that important mm -hmm. to the reader. There's an intimacy that's unique to each person reading that book of what they're doing with it. And then he gives an example and he shows a photograph of a woman, probably a, an actress that was in a movie mm -hmm. version of it. And he goes, if you're given that, your contribution and your involvement is out the window. It's almost, it's almost a great idea to do books like this Mm. no picture of anything you just enter the book and it's you 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 mm. um in collaboration with the author and yeah. who knows whether the author like had different people in mind about for a character as they wrote like mm. at different points they're thinking about somebody else who knows i mean in other words it's there's sort of an element of composite between mm -hmm. whatever clues the author gives you and things that you unconsciously fill in that is part of the value, I think, for you being the reader. It's unique to you because it's more the feelings and the insights that you're carrying along as you read rather than a movie unrolling in your head. Honestly, I it made me realize, I don't think I picture the characters very strongly, actually. No. I, I think in a way, when I read, if I think about it, I guess I sort of inevitably imagine them, not even in a concrete way, but I just kind of imagine myself somewhat, I suppose. Sure. Not like literally like me as this character. No, but, but, something, but, like but, as though you're the active element. Yeah. Opening the door somewhat. and finding and being surprised at something or whatever, you know. E somewhat, especially if the author doesn't go to a lot of trouble to give you a really fleshed out description, which... I don't know how you feel about that. I feel sort of two ways about it. I think it's difficult to do it well without it feeling like a laundry list of descriptors. Yeah, yeah. But oh, very, very much. The guy that, the book I just mentioned, um, I've got it behind me in a bag, but uh, he, 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 used, he came up with the term, what you carry through the book is significance mm -hmm. of something mm -hmm. that happens or whatever. And yeah. he gives an example too of like a, an author giving every last detail about a character, you get lost. You don't really put together a photograph in your head. It just becomes a mishmash of details. If somebody like Anna Karenina, like mm. turns, turns her head and her curls bob a certain way or whatever, mm -hmm. in the context, it simply is flirty or attractive or whatever it matters yeah. at that moment. Yeah. Not that you have to see every detail in the scene like it was a photograph or a movie. And I think that I think the books benefit. I really I like my experience of a book more than I do of a movie of a book. Yeah, I feel more um, in depth in the guts of it all 
Mm. Where the other one is, like you said something a minute ago about the sort of not a veneer, but it's just a passive. It's passive. Yeah. That's what you said. I think that's. Yeah. I think it's, it's and actually, you know, it's interesting because I and again, I know that it would be very easy to challenge that opinion because obviously there are film studies majors, you know, people who, you know, do film analysis and things like that. I would I'm not I don't say that to mean that films are a lesser art or any or visual mediums are a lesser art right. form or something like that. It's just for me, that's how I usually take it. And, and in fact, I think my ability to watch a film more actively was heavily advised by the fact that I think I read fairly actively. And I mm -hmm. think that those skills for me transferred over to watching film in a way that I don't think worked the other way around for me. Like there was never a point even when I was maybe consuming more visual media than mm -hmm. written media that I ever thought, oh, this helps me read better. Right, but there right. were definitely times when I could say for sure that knowing how to read critically has helped me interpret visual media. Yeah, and I, 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 yeah, that's a good point. And I would, I didn't mean my remarks to be as though like film is obviously lesser. That wasn't my point. It was when you make a film of a book, yeah. you're taking that story that's known already by a large part of your audience mm -hmm. because they'll typically, I mean, if you pick a book that I haven't read, then I'm, that yeah. might be fine. But but if, if I had a choice, I'd rather read it first so that I can have my own unique experience. But um, so many movies that get made of books are because the book was a gigantic hit, you know, off the bestseller list type of thing yeah. where they're going, this will bring everybody into the theater because everybody loved the book. To me, that's the last one I want to deal with, and, unless I just want to watch it for entertainment and I'm not going to read the book anyway. But yeah, I, I stick with my feeling that if I have a choice between reading the book and watching the movie of a book that matters to me, I'd rather read the book. Well, and it's interesting because like I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Sarah Zed. She's a content creator on YouTube who primarily tackles um, pop culture sort of adjacent issues. She's very similar to Lindsay Ellis. Okay. Um, but anyway, and she did a video, I think it was last year, that was about fan fiction as a genre. Mm -hmm. And um, but within that video, one thing that she talked about was this was exactly this about translating a book to film mm -hmm. and why it so often doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how it's just because from the ground up, they're just very different structurally because they're obviously like one is a visual medium and one isn't. And so like, it's really hard to make a good film out of a book, just as it would be very difficult to make a good book out of a film, because mm -hmm. one of them is predicated on the idea that you're seeing what is happening and it's developed to be visual, whereas the other one isn't. And so mm -hmm. like inevitably, a lot of times, these adaptations into film of a book fall flat because especially if you have like, let's say like first person narration in a book, right? Like Lolita would be really hard to make into a good film because it's so much of it depends on being inside his head, which doesn't really make sense to do. You're just watching some dude walk around. I have to confess to two things. I didn't yeah. read the book and I didn't see the movie, but I, oh. think, <laughs> I think you might've mentioned to me that in the movie, because of complications in culture and society, mm -hmm. it, used an older girl than yes. was relevant to the story yes because otherwise it would seem creepy or something or the censors would have rejected so all of a sudden you're like not doing what Nabokov wanted to have shown yeah <laughs> well actually I think I was telling you I don't think it was our last podcast I think it was some other time but um uh, that if you're familiar with Mary Reynolds the author she um is probably most famous for having written this trilogy about the life of Alexander the Great. Oh. Anyway, it's not important. And well, I mean, except that uh, she originally kind of gained her footing as an author by submitting a novel for an award that was specifically being funded by a filmmaking company. And the idea was whichever novel wins the prize they get the author gets a certain amount of money and they will turn the book into a film oh. but what was interesting about this one was that they never did actually make the books into films even though that was the whole idea 
because it turned out that the books that were being selected by this committee of literary critics were picking books that didn't work as movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they were judging them as books, not as what book would make a good movie. Yeah, exactly. And so exactly. even though she won this prize for her novel, it was never turned into a film because it was just not going to work. <laughs> I, I just was reading something, I don't remember mm -hmm. what author this was off the top of my head, but he was saying that several of his books have been optioned for films, and mm -hmm. then he went on to say, but I don't think any of them will ever be made. So somebody just thought, hey, this is a good one, and then they, they probably realized through reading it over, it doesn't really adapt to that medium. You know? Yeah, well, and, and to kind of bring this back around to the original question of like, why be a reader versus, you know, being a, a film watcher or something like yeah. that. I mean, going back to your original statement that this is something that's been true for you for a really long time, was there a specific book or a specific experience that kind of pushed you in the direction of being a reader over having some other identity? I'm not sure about that. I, I Some of my notes that I made up were, mm. were early influences of things. I was trying to find a copy. I think there's one in the house somewhere of this mm. book that I read when I was in sixth grade. It was called Anything Can Happen. But it was an immigrant to America writing a sort of humorous story about how bumbling weird stuff happened as they tried to accommodate themselves to American huh. life or whatever. An unusual book for me to have picked. I don't know why I bought it at some book sale when I was in sixth grade, but it's always stuck with me. And the same year in sixth grade, I read Martian Chronicles oh, by, Ray Bradbury, by Bradbury, which yeah. I picked up at a garage sale or something. And something from that did stick with me about just one character of a boy who was very misunderstood. And for some reason that was impressed me very much. <laughs> And then, you know, I, I, when I, I was talking to Casey the other day about reading the book So Big by Edna Ferber, who's an American mm -hmm. author, not very well known anymore, but a character in that, a young boy character, was reading the dictionary. Mm -hmm. That influenced me to read the dictionary. <laughs> because it, it, Basically meaning, if you're going to look up a word, don't just go, got it, close the book. You start mm -hmm. kind of rummaging around, like, what else is on this page? I think that's a great thing. I'm glad that that influenced me that way. Yeah. Um, well, if I may just jump in ever yeah, so, yeah. because that's, I was going to say just that was, I think, inevitably why I became a reader, because obviously I came from a family of readers. So it was less of a choice, <laughs> more <laughs> of a, a destiny. But um, I think what you and mom both did for me and for Finn was, fundamentally was make language itself interesting make words themselves interesting yeah. that that was you know that those were the building blocks for stories but that even on their own they were a world in and of themselves yeah. I mean I remember doing spelling bees in elementary school and uh studying for that with you and I remember uh, uh, talking about you know prefixes suffixes root words the fact that so many English words um, originate from Latin, maybe via French or something, right. and that that fascinated me that one word could have could contain so much history and information. And I, I always really do, I think, have to credit that with being the foundation for becoming a reader for I, me. So I, it's interesting that you yeah. maybe got that yourself out of this book yeah. about this kid yeah, reading. My, my mom was a reader, my dad not very much. Mm. And my mom read things that I wouldn't read at the age I was as a kid. I mean, she was mm -hmm. reading theology and philosophy and I don't know, probably some novels. Mm -hmm. But that never, it never really got pushed for some reason in our household. That's really funny. They were puzzle doers. Mm. And perhaps since they were both cryptographers in World War II, mm -hmm. that all of the kids, four of my three siblings and I, all are puzzlers of some sort, like crossword puzzles and mm -hmm. Wordle and, you know, these different, and anyway, that, that, that came through to us, but I was going to say, throw out just a bunch of other stuff yeah. from childhood that might, you might have parallels to mm -hmm. the Hardy Boys I was reading oh, yeah. as a kid and Tarzan novels, maybe in high school, James Bond and Sherlock Holmes, but I, I wasn't yet making a, thing in my head of like of saying like something that I thought was 
more than entertainment. Mm -hmm. All of it was entertainment. And somebody could say, it should always just be entertainment. But, but to my mind, being studious as a reader can have its rewards. And I would, mm -hmm. I sort of, again, this is touching again on a topic you think we might save for another time, but mm -hmm. I'm tempted to say that, that the, the literary works are sort of like chess mm -hmm. and the pop fiction is sort of like checkers mm -hmm. or some other game where you can, you know, it's not an interruption if somebody starts talking to you and you go back to your book in a minute. Not that you're not absorbed by the story, yeah. but it's not, there's not that structural element that you're pondering many things at the same time. It's simply the zoom of the story mm -hmm. is, is one kind of book. And I slowly got fascinated by ones that had more to them. Sometimes just the beauty of the language. Mm -hmm. And I held up a minute ago, this was one of the big influences of my life, reading this mm -hmm. book. <laughs> Even, this is actually not the exact copy, but the exact edition that I okay. have of uh, Look Homer and Angel. A very poetic writer. I don't know that I could read him anymore. It seems like if you hit him at the right time in your life, it could be very influential. It was for me. Another one that I re I feel like I have memories of you talking about being really big for you was the portrait of the artist as a young man. Yep. Yep. By Joyce. Yes, very much. In fact, I, I was taking a class in college and I, I brought up Thomas Wolfe and said he was the American James Joyce. I don't know if the teacher would agree with or not, but he he challenged everybody. Who? Oh, okay, this guy says he's got the American Joyce. Who do you think that is? No, nobody, nobody said Thomas Wolfe. Oh. But, but there is there is a similarity in the very sensitive mm -hmm. adolescent. Mm -hmm. uh, in Joyce's case, he grows up to be kind of a snotty know-it-all, but he gets his comeuppance in Ulysses a little bit mm -hmm. to uh, to grow through the whole stretch. That's another thing that that the um, how much of the interior life can be mm -hmm. exposed, as you were just saying before about your reading to understand yourself. Some of these people are brilliant psychologists and philosophers, if you want to say that, mm -hmm. who can through through a character and what the character is involved in and through the storyline or whatever, raise issues that are profound or deeply moving and you carry the rest of your life oh absolutely I mean I, I was just thinking back on you know some of my early childhood memories of reading things on my own of course you and mom read to us pretty much every day uh, all mm -hmm. the way through when I graduated high school but I think some of the early memories I have of reading things on my own um I'm trying to think like what was it about that that was so captivating for me because I think like you were talking about like you know with I, there were some equivalent to like the Hardy Boys or something like that yeah, yeah. or I know for mom it would have been Trixie Belden for me I do not look back on those books that for me were those books very fondly yeah. um but I think that they still taught me important lessons about being a reader and just about myself um which were the click novels by, I want to say her last name was Harrison. They were really bad. <laughs> Do you remember Ruth Chu? Oh yeah, those were better. <laughs> okay. So you've been but I wasn't reading whole... those on my own. <laughs> okay, there a whole ton of those, right? Yeah, no, the click novels. But what I think sticks with me about those as a reading experience were just the, it, it showed me that for me, advertising me was much easier through a book than it ever was through uh, like a commercial on TV because those books were so full of uh, name dropping brands of clothing, um, oh. specific cell phones, um, you know, na brand names of food and things like that. And I, I think what really- Was this a series? I think... Yes. Oh. I'll put a picture on the screen. Okay, yeah. Um, but anyway, and yeah, I just, that really profoundly influenced me in, I would say, a very negative way that took me a lot of time to actually undo. And it, it to me, is powerful as a memory because it shows just how much influence, you know, reading something can have over a person and that you, you do have to be cognizant of whether it's the uh, author's intention or not to make you feel a certain way. You just have to be cognizant of those influences on you. And that really has helped me thinking back on how much those really damaged my relationship, I think, with 
a lot of different things. I, it really shaped my ideas about what beauty was supposed to be. Uh, you know, these were kids, I think the characters were like 12 years old or 13 in the books. And they were talking about getting plastic surgery, about oh, yeah. um, needing to wear certain types of clothes to be viewed a certain way by boys. Um, and I mean, it's not like I think that that author sat down and was like, I'm going to teach little kids, you know, to to want to get boob jobs or something. But I, I mm-hmm. think that nonetheless, that's what came through from those books. And I, I think about that now as an adult about how uh, much responsibility I think a lot of kids off- authors actually have, because I don't think they realize mm-hmm. how and that, well, they should. But mm-hmm. I don't think that like a lot of times that's always taken into account how powerful that that can be. It, it's it's funny, too, because there are authors who are hoping to offer some of the outsider kids some mm-hmm. support. Mm-hmm. And they're often the ones that get into problems with parents of other kids who yeah. don't want whatever it is. There was something on the news today about um, some state that's b- making the hard line of trans people, you know, trans yes. women can't go into the ladies' restroom or you know, blah, blah, blah. All these weird yeah. things. And you just go like, yeah, why don't you screw up everybody's life you know, for the sake of this antiquated rigidity about who's who. But there are authors out there trying to have like, you know, both, I have two daddies, or yeah. something, no mommy or whatever, you know, what kind of book like that, or any, any of these um, ones that are trying to offer help rather yeah. than seduce you into a consumer culture, you know? Yeah, very much so. And And actually, I think, again, thinking about why do we read, and we both sort of touched on this a little bit, but it is when we talk about seeing yourself in a in a text, I think that people really underestimate how important book representation is, right, written representation is, because you think like, oh, if you see someone on TV, that affects you so profoundly. And I don't dis- discount that uh, experience. However, I think that because books have this sort of aura of importance around them in some ways that validation in a book I think can be just as if not more um profound for a person I mean because they just have that weight of like authority behind them yeah I think it's too that that you're um I don't there's kind of a weird way to put it you're like opening yourself to everything coming in with the book you could say, well, with a film, you can't help it. I'd go, yeah. no, but in a film, you can react and be like, ooh, or, yeah. you know, you can be conscious of how you feel about mm-hmm. whatever's happening. Like, uh, I think there are moments when somebody's about to have some weird thing happen to them and Casey's going like, tell me when it's over. She doesn't want to watch that. Yeah. Scene, you know? Yeah. But I think in a book, your defenses are down, you might say, not yeah. doing everything critically, but you're open to whatever the sentence says yeah and, you know and it's it's a little more responsibility uh as you realize it what what that can do to you or what it can, how that can affect you certainly that's the case for me I mean I know uh growing up we watched like just it having it around so ubiquitously a lot of those shows that did like product placement and things but none of that ever really stuck with me as much as it did in those click novels I think I was just yeah. the right age yeah, yeah. um and 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 did having grown up in a very literary family you know thinking of books as these very weighty objects of truth Mm -hmm. and you know Mm -hmm. um all of that I think that that was why for me it was so much easier for them to get under my skin and to think like oh this is reality because it's in a book you know Mm -hmm. like books are about truth and about um you know, they're, they're hard to be published. So lots of people looked at this, like, and thought this is important or good or should be preserved. Whereas I think with films and and television shows, it just kind of went, it kind of washed over me. And I'm sure there was some influence of that, but those, those books, that's a very strong early memory I have of Mm. both being very interested in being a reader. I mean, I read them quickly. I, whenever there was a new one, I was like, right there. I'm like, I want the next one. I want to know. Um, but nevertheless, I think as an adult in retrospect, it, it, it's, it's a cautionary tale for me as well. That's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I I like to think I've grown enough since then that I can recognize when that influence is happening much better than I could at the time. Certainly. I hope. Well, Um, one one you brought up that I went over my head, you might say, or I I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it particularly until you brought it up 
you didn't originate this probably, but you're onto this, yeah. was with um, J.K. Rowling. Oh, yeah. Having subtleties that mm-hmm. imply things that aren't good or aren't pleasant that, yeah. are, that are not not jumping off the page outright, but they're supporting cliches or, mm-hmm. or uh, bad you know, ideas. Uh, and they're just in in the middle of an exciting story, and yeah. they could you know go over a per, go through a person and just kind of reinforce a stereotypic blunder, you know. Yeah, I think for her the one I think what you're referencing, I think I even sent you the link. I don't know if you ever watched it, but uh, Sean did a whole video essay of di- 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 diving into um, okay. the sort of thematic background to Harry Potter, and the one that really stuck stuck out to me. <laughs> I highly recommend anybody watch his video essay. It's really good, but when he talked about how um, at the house in like that, that dark wizard house in the fifth book where they're all kind of trapped for convenience right, for right. long stretches of time, they had the, these like stuffed heads of the house elves hanging mm. on the wall at the house because it was a bad house where bad people lived. Right, but right. then like later when they're decorating for Christmas, they like put Santa hats on the, the stuffed <laughs> house elf heads. Yeah. And yeah. I just hearing him read that out loud, I was like, oh my God, that's so yeah, that's yeah. creepy yeah, did, <laughs> in a way that I didn't really think about, which again is yeah. kind of like going back to this idea of like, you know, books can, they they really, again, not in a way that visual media can't do, but like they really can produce, you know, this, yeah, like you said, reinforcement of things you already thought or mm-hmm. it can somewhat wash over you if you go into a book in good faith, assuming that it's benign, whatever mm-hmm. you're reading, mm-hmm. which I think was a big lesson for me as a more mature reader to really recognize that, you know, yes, I think that books do hold a place in our culture of being sort of almost sacred, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. objects. Mm-hmm. But that that doesn't mean that you that everything that's within them is something you have to or even should yeah, agree with. Whole, yeah. yeah, or or read uncritically. Yeah, actually, I was just going to say critical thinking is mm-hmm. the key element that allows you to pause in reading and think, hmm, I'm not sure what I think about that. I mean, a mm-hmm. superficial one that's more of an aesthetic issue, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I just read a book that I highly recommend. It was really cool. Mm-hmm. It was just a novel called... Um, Salvage the Bones mm-hmm. by Jasmine Ward. Mm-hmm. And I read a couple of things about it online where like one guy saying, this book really shouldn't have won the National Book Award. This isn't that mm-hmm. good, blah, 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 blah. And um, I like the book immensely, um, but there, but she, she works in uh, references to Medea from mythology. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, I'm kind of wrestling with whether that stood out as a blunder mm. like to try to oomph it up you know with a little intellectual element mm-hmm. or whether that whether that's really a good thing I'm, I'm not really I'm kind of on the fence about it but putting that aside I thought the book was fantastic but that's the kind of thing that you wind up <clears throat> instead of just going okay finish that book what am I going to read now like you it yeah. kind of lives with you and you think it over mm-hmm. uh, and you might come up with some of the insights that the JK Rowling readers have come up with after the yeah. fact and going, you know, there's some questionable shit in this book <laughs> <laughs> or in this story, you know. Yeah, or or at the very least, it's like, let's talk about the implications of some of these things. Yeah. And I think that also goes back to the kind of, and I hate to make this like books versus film because I, I don't think it's really fair to compare them, but I think it's sort of inevitable to compare mm-hmm. them in a discussion about stories. But um with a book because it's text, which is static in a way that a film is not, obviously. Um, I think it's also easier um, when you're in a class setting to be taught those critical thinking skills using a text of Mm -hmm. that nature, just because it's not moving around. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can really pause on each thing very easily. I guess that's kind of inconsequential, but it's just something I was thinking about when you said that. I think that's a big thing actually, because Mm -hmm. a movie, runs by you at its speed people don't Mm -hmm. tend to like stop the movie and say let's back it up and watch that scene again unless Mm -hmm. they misunderstood something on the tv unless you're in a movie theater you have no choice yeah the movie and it 
rolls over you. Mm-hmm. Even even a audio book has that element that the way they're structured, you go, damn it, if I, I didn't hear what that word was and I think it matters, I'm just going to go th- three minutes back mm-hmm. and listen to this whole thing over again, just get that one word, you know? Whereas if you're reading the book, not only can you resolve the question of what is mm-hmm. that word or whatever easily, but you're reading at your speed. Everybody's reading at their own speed mm-hmm. and in their own privacy. It's a very much a by yourself thing, like your dreams are your own, you know? Yeah. And and um, I don't know, I think Joseph Campbell had some joke of like mythology or are public dreams guaranteed to be good to have or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, like for what yeah. is mythology? It is, it is like a public dream kind of, yeah. whereas when you're reading, it's uniquely inside you. That's why the business of what does somebody look like, mm-hmm. you know, you go, oh yeah, you're right. You, okay, you proved to me on page seven, they said the guy was really short. Well, I didn't see that. And I pictured this tall guy and it, I had a wonderful experience reading the book, you know? Yeah. So it's like, if you're discussing it and trying to get technical about it, you do have to stick with what exactly is mm-hmm. said. And then you're in a public arena analyzing the text. But in the yeah. reading of a novel, I think there is that privacy that's um, really cool that it's just your experience. You read at your speed. You might pause and reread something if you want to. Mm-hmm. You know, anyway, that I think that's a special thing about reading. Yeah, and I would I would add actually that um, I agree, but I would also say that I think what's nice about reading to me is that it doesn't have to be a solitary activity, actually. Like, and I actually think this is a similarity, as a matter of fact, between books and film in a way, because if you think about like going to a movie theater, it's a solitary experience in the sense that you're quiet, theoretically. You're quiet watching something, but you're in a room of people all having the same experience. And you can choose afterwards to make it a social activity and discuss it, or you can just like walk away by yourself and just go home. Mm -hmm. And I think that books are actually more similar or can be more similar especially nowadays than has ever been the case before because and in that way I think it's a it's the perfect activity for a person who falls somewhere in the middle of the like introvert extrovert sort of spectrum sure. because sure. you and it's true and it's it, it strikes me because I think I don't know very many readers who would call themselves that who are not interested in talking about books you know like the yeah, the right. act of reading yeah. itself is somewhat solitary but even then I think um mom was saying that she was talking to uh Nana my grandmother about this and that she who apparently she's also quite a voracious reader she was saying that one of the things she really likes about books and I completely agree is that you you aren't alone because you're actually in conversation with that author right without Mm -hmm. having to the social pressure of having to like engage with them you know actively you can kind of do it in the privacy of your own mind, but you are, you know, working together with them That's to very true. create it an experience. A, yeah, it is like a combined activity of the authors offering all these words mm-hmm. and you're absorbing them mm-hmm. in your own way. Yeah. So you're, so it is sort of a, co- a collusion between the author and the reader rather yeah. than, well, that, that's why it's not just pouring over you. It's yeah. you, it's you sifting through yeah. the book. Yeah. But, but well, I, I, I agree with yeah. you that people do like to um, also talk about the books they enjoy. It's it's really wonderful to find somebody who likes the same books yeah. you like, especially if you're not on the bestseller bandwagon. Yeah. Because I think a lot, I think there are people, I mean, again, maybe this sounds critical, but who are, who pick a book off the bestseller list saying, this is guaranteed to be a good book. Mm. And if somebody says, what are you reading? And I name it, they'll go, oh yeah, I've heard of that. Kind mm-hmm. of, you know, there's kind of a world that's offered mm-hmm. as opposed to reading an obscure book and not knowing anybody else that ever read that book. Yeah. You know, it's a different thing. But yeah. you, might, you might over time meet somebody who has the same experiences and you might start sharing your obscurities with each other and then you yeah. form a very strong bond with another reader. Yeah. And and I, I think that nowadays that's just made so much easier. I think, I mean, I, I know that we're in a period where deservedly so we're critiquing 
social media and we're critiquing uh, the internet culture that we're living in. But I think one of the benefits of it is that sort of ability to connect with other people on your own terms, but with relative ease. I mean, if you think about platforms like Goodreads or TikTok or YouTube or something like that, it is passive in the sense that you don't have to actively participate in those platforms. You can just consume the what other people have produced right. and use that as a source of entertainment or validation or whatever you, your reasoning is. But you also have the opportunity to reach out and touch other people and make, you know, actual social connections um, through a, a through reading, even though reading is by its nature, despite what we're saying about being a you know conversation with the author, it is something you do alone, mm -hmm. right? Like you, it, there's really no way around it, and except if you're reading out loud to you know right. somebody right. else, exactly. which is also a way. Obviously, it can be done, but I think that that's not traditionally if a person says i'm a reader they're not thinking of it as like oh i, I read out loud to people yeah, when, when i was reading out loud to you guys mm -hmm. i'd sit in the hallway and both of you had your doors open and you were separate in in your separate yeah. beds and i would read something and i kind of was the ringleader because yeah. i was in control of the book but i would i could stop and say wow that was a beautiful sentence and reread mm -hmm. it and force it upon you guys. And I could say, do you know what that word means? Mm -hmm. And you guys could each make a stab at it or or you know or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it was there was an involvement of all of us mm -hmm. in a in a small one person reading with three mm -hmm. people listening or whatever you call it. Um uh which is very appropriate to the difference of our ages or the fact that yeah. I'm a parent or whatever. But I, I think that. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, well, uh, an audio book mm -hmm. has a couple of weird qualities, like let's say the audio book of the Harry Potter books mm -hmm. was phenomenal, and the guy got a lot of awards because he did unique character portraits in voice yeah. of every character in the damn thing, which was ridiculous yeah. to me, many people. Uh, but even a regular book, the, the, author, the writer, the um, readers usually pitch a voice for the different characters yeah when i read out loud i don't do that i try yeah. to put the right expression in the yeah. out loud remark but i don't say like oh come in children you know i don't i don't try to do a bunch of voices no. you know i mean i guess it's a gift if you can but it's not the same experience i have in reading the book when i read the mm. book there are no voices no I'm just absorbing significance and ideas and information yeah and putting together something in collusion with the author you know yeah and, you do still get the voice though like I, I think that some authors have a gift for their their character's voice being very strong even if in your own head you're not thinking of it in terms yeah. of like yeah that's edit. no that's a good a good example of that Casey listens to a lot of Walter Mosley who's a black mm. detective mm -hmm. fiction writer mm -hmm. and and that's true in that book I mentioned salvage of uh, uh, salvage the bones that author's black mm -hmm. and has a southern mississippi number of years ago kind mm -hmm. of setting mm -hmm. that i really appreciate her being able to evoke that in mm. in the blank in the text on the page well and know. actually that actually prompts me to mention something that i we almost touched on this and we may kind of have touched on this when we we're talking about translated fiction but i think it's worth mentioning about not translated fiction as well but going back to what you were saying about, you know, representation in fiction or in picture books or whatever, I, I think to me, that is the big difference between having, let's say, a white author mention that a character in the text is Black versus right. having a Black author write a story where they may not ever even mention that. Because like, one of those is almost trying to take a book and create a film out of it because it's easy to just say like, oh yeah, and that character was black. But is that really representation when all you really did was kind of tick a box without necessarily like thinking about what that means and or mm -hmm. how that would impact that that character's like life experiences? That always is something that I think about because when I'm trying to diversify my reading, it does go so much deeper than just oh, this protagonist is Asian, does that advise 
right. how this person it inter it interacts with and engages with the world. And I think it's so much easier to do that when you're reading something by an author who's had those lived experiences. Yeah, I, here's my example mm. I just read fairly recently. Mm. You see it? It's yeah. the under, Underworld by Delillo. Mm -hmm. he, has, he has a number of Black characters that appear, mm. and I think he does them wonderful justice. He seems to just have a remarkable empathy for everybody mm -hmm. in this book. It's a terrific book, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's just an interesting thing. I mean, if you you like, you could read the Hardy Boys, mm. and there's really no reason they couldn't have both been black. Yeah. Except if you look at the cover, you assume they're white because that's what they portray. Well, but I, I would challenge that ever so by saying, like, kind of why I'm bringing this up is like, could they? Because if they're written by a white author, even if you put, and I think this is actually what people's critique, if they're giving the critique in good faith, which often they're not, is of, um. What did they call it with the Disney movies? Like blackwashing a character. Yeah, no, I, I think I, that I, the I good faith version of that argument would be if you don't change the character to have that, have had some sort of influence on the way relevant. that they yeah, interact yeah. with the world, yeah. then you haven't really done anything. And that's really something that I think a lot of white authors are guilty of that's is really they think... Point. Yeah. They think that uh, there was this post on Tumblr that made this point very, very well back when I guess there was some discussion about Batman, some iteration of Batman being black. And the the author of this post on Tumblr um, was black. And they said, you know, that could be really interesting, but not if they don't change anything except that, because yeah. they were like, you know, think about it, like Gotham City, we all know this is New York City, we all, you know, this is a thing we understand. If you have a Black person, first of all, how many Black people are in that position in terms of like social status, st social status right? Yeah, like Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne comes from this immensely rich family. What would it mean for this person to be from a very rich Black family in New yeah. York? Would they be engaging in the same social circles? Would they be engaging with other social circles? Right. How would that have helped them bring up other Black people who would then right. probably be in these other positions? Like you'd have to fundamentally change the story right. to make Oh yeah, sense. you're totally right. It'd be like, my, using go back, going back to my example, if you yeah. like just change the cover of the Hardy Boys book yeah. and put Black kids on the cover, yeah. you're not really doing anything. No. Or you're doing something so superficial, it's not worth doing. What you should do is say, Hey, why don't we create a, a detective series yeah. that has black kids in it? If you want to do that, or yeah. you know, whatever. But yeah, there has to be authenticity all around, not just like substituting a black or a white yeah. character. Because again, going back to what I said originally about why I think people read, or certainly why I do, it's like if you're reading to be able to develop empathy. You can't really do that if you're not reading something authentic. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if you're reading to understand something about yourself, it's not, you're not gonna get that if you just have a coat of paint essentially slapped on top mm -hmm. of like a, usually it's a white character, mm -hmm. right? And it's not that I think that white authors can't expand their ability to write other types of people, but I think that unfortunately very often they don't really try. And also like the the ones that do try, I think, and, and you know, feel free to, you know, contradict me if you think I'm wrong, but I think unfortunately a lot of times the ones that try, whether they do it well or not, end up getting pushed over authentic versions of the same idea. You know, like if you have a white author who writes, even if they try to do it well a story about a Black character having Black experiences, that's still not an experience that author ever personally had. Right. And I think that unfortunately, sometimes that gets pushed as like, see, yeah. but then you, you instead of instead of promoting a book by a Black author writing about the same theme, right. you know right. what I mean? I, I guess that gets a little bit muddy, but that's just my right. feeling about yeah, that. I guess, I, yeah, I, 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 would, I would avoid saying, um, if you use any kind of character that you can't authentically find in yourself, yeah. or what's that phrase? Um, where you're taking somebody other's culture, you know what I mean? Like, oh, cultural appropriation. Appropriating, right. Yeah. Appropriation. So you go, well, if you push that to its logical false 
and you're mm -hmm. saying no woman can have a man character mm -hmm. of any color no man can have a woman character of any color because how would he know what he's really doing mm -hmm. but i think the books that are good have authors who have the profundity mm -hmm. uh, a la carl jung to realize that everybody is both male mm -hmm. and female not everybody's black and white but some people can um, feel their way into a world either from just yeah. their life's experiences, which I don't know whether they'd had them or not. But but I guess you'd say you if you have if you have enough experience of your own in some realm, mm -hmm. you can trust your critical faculties to judge whether an author is bogus or not yeah. in representing something. Yeah, but I think that is important. And I think also there needs to be um, an acknowledgement that there's a big different, there's a big separation between an author writing a story and a publishing house perpetuating certain publishing habits. You yeah. know, like I think that there's no big push by anybody that I can think of that would say, oh, you know, white people can't write non-white characters or whatever. But I think that the, there is a bigger push by, by some, myself included, to encourage publishing houses to right. not only, or at least not primarily always promote right. white authors writing whoever and saying, oh, we checked the diversity box because this right. white author who's very popular wrote a book about a, a black character. Right, you know? right. I guess, I, you know, I not guess to say it. that that author can't do it, but should their voice be the only one that matters when we're talking about yeah, when we're talking about developing empathy and uh, being able to see yourself when we're talking about reading. No, I, that's that's a good point. I, the, the authors, the kind of authors I'm thinking of deserve, uh, in, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to be published because they're brilliant and, yeah. and very worthwhile. Yeah. And there's a lot of crap that gets published for whatever yeah. reason, perhaps even there, there could even be that bogus motive of saying, oh, we've checked the box. We, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've published, you know, 10 books this year, yeah. two by Black authors, two by Asian authors, you know, we're, yeah. we're in good shape morally. You go, are they any, are the books any good? Yeah. You know, surely you can find, sure, you know, you, I think you're saying, oh, we want the door to be open so that good authors that represent whatever yeah. it is are found and published. Yeah, exactly. And I think luckily we're we're getting to a place where that's at least part of the conversation, certainly. And I, I think that's a really positive thing because I, as a reader who has read books that I see myself in and who has read books that have, I think, enabled me to be empathetic in a way that maybe without them I wouldn't have, I, I desperately want other people to have that opportunity. And I, I do acknowledge that we're in flux with that and that traditionally that just hasn't been the case. Right. So I'm no, glad that we're moving in that direction because I know, and you too, like as people who love books and who love reading so much, I, I think it's only positive that more people have the opportunity to, to have those experiences. Yeah, it's funny that that um, most of you know most of my reading is is going into the privacy of my own brain with yeah. the story. It's almost like I'm going into a parallel world. Yeah, and I might love certain parallel worlds to pieces and want it, want other people to go visit them yeah. too. You know, uh, but then I come back to this one and I go. Hum -de -dum -de -dum. I have a pretty humdrum life. I need to. I need to go to another parallel universe. Again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I got, and just, I got a, you know, a whole yeah. pile of examples of places that I think are wonderful to go visit. Yeah, and actually, I was going to say, as we're sort of wrapping up, I, let let's talk about some of those places because we've been talking so abstractly. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about why do we read? Let's 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 talk about some books. So, if you you had a couple you wanted to go through, let's let's do that. Here's one that I think is very fascinating. Mm. Elias Canetti, Auto da Fe. Mm. The German version is actually Die Blindung, The Blinding. Oh. It's, a, it's a terrific story, really wacky. Superficially, this is not my take, but to say mm -hmm. this man wrote one novel and he got the Nobel Prize. Wow. It's a good book. I was going to say that's, that's a pretty intriguing. Well, it's, good, it's good 
indirect evidence or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's the, the characters are all demented in different <laughs> ways. And, <laughs> and, and everything that happens is people, people's understanding missing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really, really terrific book. What I think you might have read too, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. Yes, I read that exact edition. Okay, it's really a good book. Uh, with, Who's the translator? This one is, I don't actually remember this. Is William Weaver, mm. okay, of this edition. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah, that, that, that's the funny one. This is the one where William Weaver said that he, he they cite uh, a passage from Dostoevsky and he says, mm. in the beloved Constance Garnett translation, <laughs> which I'm a big fan of. But, yeah. Uh, as far as what the story is about, if anybody hasn't read it, uh, a a man realizes, I think it's a man first, who realizes yeah. that the copy of the book he has is imperfect. Like he reads through a chapter and suddenly he's, the rest of the book is some other book. I've worked in bookstores many years and that does happen. In fact, oh, really? I, just found one, I just found one at work where two pages were reversed, like, oh. from, you know, like 99 to 101, you know, like there are, there are publishing things that go wrong. Books are usually assembled from signatures, which are like pamphlets. Mm. They put all the pamphlets together so that the, the binding is extremely strong because each group is bound together and then they're all bound as one. If mm. they screw up with one of those pamphlety things and put one from a different book, you'll suddenly go, what the hell? And you're like, <laughs> trying to figure out what's wrong. And you finally realize this doesn't even make any sense at all. They put the wrong signature in there, mm. that the, the wrong pamphlet. So that's what happens in this book. The man goes back to the bookstore to get a better copy, runs into a woman who had the same problem, and they go off on this adventure trying to get the rest of that story. Mm. But instead, they keep discovering what they think is going to be the rest of that story, but instead it's the beginning of something else which intrigues them, and then they want to find out the rest of that story. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendous tour de force because you think you you would say this sounds like a terribly frustrating book. Why would I ever read it? It's because Italo Calvino or Italo Calvino is so mm -hmm. good that he persuades you over and over again that you're that you want to read this other book. I would second that absolutely. I think um, if on a winter's night a traveler is a love letter from Calvino to readers and writers, honestly. Like, I think it's just, yeah, it's a love letter to that reader-author uh, relationship. It's really fabulous. I absolutely yeah, agree. It's a terrific book. Mm -hmm. Really fun. <laughs> Definitely very fun and weird. Yeah, oh. I, I don't just, I, the trouble, you know, it's like, here's Petersburg or St. Petersburg. Mm. I think it's been translated both ways by uh, Andre Bailey. This is set in... St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, I read it so long ago, I can't really, I think I, there, there's a thing we didn't get to, rereading. Oh, yeah. I actually tried to reread this in another translation and didn't like it, mm. and this is the translation that I liked. By who? Uh, this the translation is by John Kornos, mm. but there's a newer one that's get, that got more attention, mm -hmm. but I, I, it was too bogged down with footnotes and things, and I kind of lost the thread Mm. So my trying attempt to read this a second time didn't go very well, but I might go back and read this version again because it's mm. a good book. I read another book by the same author called Silver Dove, which was super good also. And I mean, I don't want to monopolize this. There's a famous <laughs> author, Ferdy Durkee. I mean, the, the author's name is Vitold Gambrovich. Mm. Ferdy Durkee is one of his books. I've read almost all of his stuff. He's, he's very eccentric. Uh, the characters are wacky. Um, I don't know what to say. It's surrealistic almost. I mean, We're getting a sense of your taste. Wacky, strange. <laughs> well, uh, let me just read. Okay, to, uh, as far as authors go, Thomas yeah. Mann, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Borges, yeah, more fantastic. Uh, Herman Brock. His one that I didn't get through. I've read other books by him, but I'm going to go back to the Death of Virgil. Mm -hmm which is mm -hmm. set in ancient Rome with, or ancient Roman times, mm -hmm. with Virgil on his deathbed throughout mm -hmm. the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, that's really weird. Uh, Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe. 
wonderful Japanese writer mm -hmm. I really like a lot. Um, this the story plot is a man is in on a desert deserty dune area. He finds a gigantic hole with a woman, with a house down there, a hut anyway. Okay. And he he I think there's a ladder. And mm. He finds a ladder and he goes down and he finds this woman who lives down there and they're talking for a while. And he goes, well, this is just wacko. I'm going to leave now. And he decides, he finds out somebody's removed the ladder and he has no way to get out of there. And the woman is one of a number of people who are in this situation where they're supposed to, I forget whether they're digging sand and they send it up in buckets. And if they don't, they don't get their food and water. Huh. It's like this Kafka-esque kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Very intriguing. It's a beautiful copy of it too. Can I see the cover again? It might be. It might be from the movie. There was a movie made oh, of this okay. That's in 1964 gorgeous. that I think won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. Oh, okay. See, I don't have an aversion to having people on the covers if it's a good cover. Yeah, yeah, no, that <laughs> but it has to be a good cover. But I, I, you know, you, it's your turn if you've got something. Yeah, sure. Um, I was going to say, I the way I put my stack together. I was also thinking about myself as like a teenager a little bit and like, you know, what get people into reading. But I did have a couple that came a little later. One series that was really important to me and very formative in terms of building an identity as a reader uh, was the Goosebumps series. And um, as a, as a te an English teacher, I still promote these. I think for any, like, especially like young, younger teenager, if they're like, oh, I hate reading. Like these, I still think are a good gateway drug <laughs> into yeah, yeah, getting yeah. them to change their mind. I think um, so I reading still, is good. Yeah, I still stand behind those for sure. I always like to tell myself that the first literary book that I ever read on my own of my own volition was The Picture of Dorian Gray, but that's not true because <laughs> that one yeah. came later. But yeah. the first one that I ever read just completely on my own. I don't even remember where I knew about it from or why I was reading it, but that was really influential on my taste in reading was Young Torless by Robert Mazzeo. Oh, okay. You read I've read it so in many German times. In German and in English. Yeah, I, I did. It's the first, I, I want to say the first novel I ever read in German, but the first novel that I picked that I read in German. Um, and this one is translated, I think it's the only translation there is by... Um, Eitna Wilkins and Ernst Kaiser. I'm pretty sure they're the only ones who ever translated it. Oh, yeah, but... yeah. No, they're very famous. Yeah, they, they translated this one of his, too. Oh, okay, yeah. The Man Without Qualities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which I still yeah. haven't read, but also yeah, I know is... you speak of that one highly. Now, this yeah. one I liked as a teenager, I think, because they are teenage characters, but it's such a brutal story about um, mob mentality, specifically among teenagers, I think, but yeah. you can see it in adults as well, and how yeah. kids are willing, or people in general, are just kind of willing to go along with things. It's very much about, like, bystanderism and, um, and, and how that can lead to really ugly and unpleasant consequences when you don't have a person who's willing to stand up to bad things happening, even if they have mixed feelings about it, or even getting swept up in reactionary movements and things like that that just because it's convenient to do so or it's yeah. you know adhering to the status quo um really really good book it yeah I think I read it at the right time in my life as a teenager to start thinking about that kind of mentality of joining in with a crowd yeah. and you know not standing up for people it very yeah. much yeah. made me want to not be like the main character of this yeah, yeah. no very very good point and that age that you were at is one where people are searching for mm -hmm. who they are and the temptation to be one of the crowd and to mm -hmm. wear the same stuff and know the same things or whatever, mm -hmm. or like the same music is yeah. a temptation because it gives you an identity. Yeah. Whereas making, carving your own is a bit harder. Yeah, and it, it was, I, I I hate the catcher in the rye, but I'll probably say that every time, but uh, this was my catcher in the rye, like I think. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to be like Torless. <laughs> I didn't come away with this thinking like, that's who I want to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely not, but very, very good. Um, another one that falls into that category for me that was really a big deal for me as a kid when I read it, and I actually managed to find the exact edition of this, um, was specifically this 
version of the Twelfth Night. Okay. It is like a, a comic bookized version yeah, of the yeah. story. But why this really struck me is, and then I read the play as an adult. I actually didn't like the play as much as I remember. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought the I thought the play was okay. Yeah. But um, but this really, if we're talking about representation, this was the first time that I ever realized that gender isn't a real thing, or at the very least, like gender roles are things that we made up and that are not. In innate qualities and that gender is something that you can actually change and play around with and do different things. And I, I was so young when we had these books. I think I was like eight or nine or something like that, whatever. I was just starting to be able to read on my own. Yeah. And I just absolutely loved this. Viola as Cesario was my hero until we watched Mulan and then it was Mulan. But <laughs> I just, I loved that idea that you, that was something you could do that I never probably would have thought about at that age if it weren't for reading this. Um, although I am disappointed that I didn't like the play as much in its unabridged form as an adult, but that really affected me. Um, and then an actual recommendation that I would make for people because I think it's just so good and it's hilarious because we were just talking about the, you know, writing authentically, but this is actually a man writing a woman character. However, I think the book is so good and he really, obviously new women in real life probably I know, I know what I know what this women. book is I know you I, do I know, what is it it's, it's William Somerset mom yes okay but I don't remember the name of the book theater okay and oh, I have this lovely. really lovely copy of it yeah. but it doesn't have the title except for here <laughs> okay um theater, yeah. I absolutely fell in love with this book I was interested in reading more from him because I loved this book so much and actually, it was the second book by him that I read. The first one was Of Human Bondage, which I thought oh. was kind of, well, well, it didn't hit me. Um, I, I guess I was just at that point that I read it a little bit too old to just be consuming coming of age stories. Yeah. But I loved this. It's about this aging, aging, she's like in her 40s, actress. And the idea is that she considers herself an actress first and foremost even off of the stage and mm -hmm. that she goes through life thinking of the things that she experiences as scenes in a play. And there's this one point where her son comments, um, you know, I was always afraid as a kid to open a room that you had gone into by yourself because I thought if I opened the door, nobody would be there. Yeah. And and she kind of brushes this off, but it's absolutely true. Like, no matter what's going on in her life, her inner dialogue is, what is my character in this scene? And what does that make these people? And how should I therefore interact with them? Like, yeah. oh, this is the moment where if I cry, they'll react in this way, because that's what the next logical thing to happen would be. And it's it's sort of this, it's, it's very sad, because yeah. it's so obvious that a lot of why she does this is wrapped up in um, the way that women are treated and their value that they hold or don't hold, especially as they're getting older. And, um, and that she uses this as a way to push back against that system a little bit. I think it was very much through the female gaze that this yeah, was written. Logically female. Very much so. It was very, very good. Um, obviously there are certainly female authors who write about this as well, but I just, I just was really impressed with this, not because he was a man writing such a convincing female character, but because I thought his insights into, um, how being a woman in that society at that time, and even now impacts the way that women had to engage with other people and the defense mm -hmm. mechanisms that they had to develop to thrive to the best of their abilities, mm -hmm. especially getting older. Yeah. Very, very good. Highly recommend this. And then the last one that I would mention, because we talked about Harry Potter quite a bit, I would offer as a counter to that. Or well, you won't be surprised. Yeah, I know you, I would guess Bartimaeus. Yes. Okay. I absolutely love the Bartimaeus trilogy by Jonathan Stroud. This is the first one, which is the Amulet of Samarkand. It's it's one of those book series that I think deceptively is marketed as being for young adult readers, but I would make the argument that it could just as easily be enjoyed and be just as insightful and a wonderful, fun 
um, and informative reading experience for an adult reader. I, having reread these as an adult, I can still see how much effort he put into the world building of this and yeah, the messaging of that book, of that world building. Yeah, he's exploring basically using this Harry Potter-esque, if I must, fantasy world uh, to explore themes like class and uh, leadership and um, how innate those things really are. As a, It's definitely a metaphor for the British class system, but even as an American reading this, I found it very profound in the way that it it, it it explores that topic and also about you know social capital and who can and can't have it talking about you know at what point does it become acceptable to push back against power structures can they be fixed do they have to be torn down um, topics that I think are very relevant now but written in a really engaging way through really fun adventures. I think a, 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 a remarkable quality in that series, I think, is that the mm -hmm. young man at the beginning, mm -hmm. who is the protagonist and you're rooting for him, mm -hmm. slowly is corrupted yes. until he becomes the villain mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. And it's really, that's remarkable. I can't even think of another book in which something like that happens exactly like that. You know? No, but, certainly not a young adult series. And I know they're really well regarded as being... Yeah more profound than I think a lot of people think of young adult fiction oh, being, yeah, which very much, is, very much I think, a, I think that's a fault. I think that in some ways, young adult writers and writers for kids have even greater responsibility to be purposeful when they're putting their stories together. I think it's safest with, with, with a family, mm. um, just like saying, your your kids can watch anything on TV as long as you're mm -hmm. watching it with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're little, so that when something comes up and they go, "Wow, that's weird. What was that all about?" You have some you you know what they're talking about, and you can mm -hmm. help guide you know the answer or whatever. And similarly with the books, instead of just going here, read all these; they're guaranteed to be safe, so I don't have to worry about yeah. it. Be involved with them. Yeah. Read the same book they're reading, or read with them, or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a good thing for a relationship between a parent and a child. Definitely. And, and and to kind of round off the conversation, I think that, you know, why do we read? I think that as we've kind of gone through this, it is to make connections with other people, to make connections with yourself. It's, um, you know, it's fun. I think you started off by saying that it's just like a fun thing to do. It's, it's you know, it's a hobby that has, it's very multifaceted. Um, it can, you can use it in a passive way. You can use it in a very active way. It's just so endlessly able to be shaped into whatever kind of experience you want. And there are stories to, to do anything that you want, you know, whether you want to just, you know, have a laugh or you want to cry or whatever you want to yeah. do or Stephen, feel. Stephen King apparently uh, said books are portable magic. Yeah. That's a good line. I think that's a good way to summarize it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact that I can like pull any one of these small, relatively small objects off of that shelf and have an entire, you know, insight into that author's head. I, yeah, I just, yeah. I, I find that endlessly pleasing. And, and, you're, and, and you're not just rummaging around in yeah. the attic. They've, they've created something yeah. beautiful and mm -hmm. um, purposeful that mm -hmm. you're ex ex getting to explore. Yeah, or not, as we discovered. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope so. We hope to curate just the, those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least that you're, you're getting whatever they they claim is that. Yeah. Like their distillation of some ideas and mm -hmm. beauty and whatever else is in there. You know, and yeah. I've found enough um, that I am very, you know, and it, when you find an author you really like, it's great because you can read more works by them. Mm -hmm. it's also helpful. Yeah, it always, definitely. It always pay off, but a never-ending journey. The never-ending story. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that kind of shores that up for now. Although I feel like this is something we could easily revisit. I mean, it's such a an endless. Yeah, I really, topic I really of feel discussion. like lifting all these up and sh saying. Like, I know. If anybody likes anything that I'm saying, please take <laughs> note of these all these titles. Here. Yeah, exactly. Here they are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
All right, and on that note, thank you. You made it to the end of this. I hope there was some insight uh, that was gained here. I certainly enjoyed the discussion, Dee. So thank you for joining up with me again, and I can't wait to do it next month. Okay. Okay. Toodles.